Right, so as we come out of a season um, where we've been separated in so many ways and, and disconnected in so many ways, um, I think this building is really an opportunity for us to come back together, um, to experience one another in person again, to experience God together in worship. And, um, and I think that it's a really a pivotal moment for, for all of us um, as we, as we temp attempt to reconnect as human beings. And I think this, this, the momentum of the building opening and all the extra space it's giving us, I think it's an awesome opportunity to just, again, find community together um, after, after being apart for so long. Well, uh, happy Father's Day to all the dads in the room. Yeah. It's like happy Mother's Day. Woo! Happy Father's Day. Is it Father's Day today? I didn't even realize that. Um, hey, you know, what's the best way to watch a fly fishing tournament? It's live stream. Okay. Yeah, I... I didn't know that. Uh, somebody said that to me when I, this morning, and, and I asked them to leave. But that was just, it's <laughs> awful. So, Randy, I love you. It's Randy back there. So, no, this is a place for all broken people. Listen, even, <laughs> even terrible dad jokes, okay? So, dads, we, seriously, we, we are, uh, we're, we're, we're so thankful and grateful for you and the role you play in your families. And, and today, we, we have some photo booths, just like we did for Mom's Day, but they're they're a little more manly. Uh, so we would love to capture a picture, or, you know, for you to take a, a picture of your, you and your family. So after service, it's in our new lobby. So you can, do, you can walk up to the main entrance or you can drive up to the main entrance and go in the main lobby there. And there are a couple of uh, stations there uh, where you guys can have uh, some photo opportunities uh, with, uh, with dad. So hope you hope you'll take advantage of that. Uh, this past Thursday, a, uh, a memory popped up in, uh, in Facebook from seven years ago, and it was this, this picture right here, and this is a picture of my mom's master bathroom door after I took a Louisville slugger to it uh, because I got stuck uh, in there, and uh, I, this is like 11 o'clock at night. I went in to take a shower and brush my teeth, get ready for bed, and I went to go out, and uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't open. It's a, it's a pocket door. Uh, it's a 60-year-old pocket door, and it had enough. And so it, it wasn't moving, and so I called for help. Like, literally, I had to call my mom on the phone and say, I'm stuck in your bathroom. And she said, yeah, I've been having, having trouble with, with that door. <laughs> and so this wasn't the first time, okay? It was the last time. It was the last time, and uh, she came in. She's on the other side trying to get it open. She can't get it open. I mean, we're working on this thing for like 20 minutes. Okay, I'd just taken a shower, and I'm sweating like a stuck pig right now. And, and we just decided it's not coming open, so we're going to have to use force. And we were able to get the corner open. She handed me a hammer, and I, I put the first hole in it. I'm like, this isn't going to do it, so I need something bigger. So a few minutes later, she comes back with a Louisville slugger. And, uh, and so after a few swings on this door, uh, I, finally, I finally got uh, free and, uh, and had to take another shower uh, after that. But... <laughs> Um, there are a few morals to this story. One is, listen, stay away from pocket doors, okay? <laughs> they are of, of the devil. And if, if, if it was swinging a bat at one is very therapeutic, by the way. Um, but but here's, the, here's the real moral of the, of the story, and that's this. Uh, never settle for being stuck. Never, never settle for being stuck. I mean, you know, I never panicked, right? Not once did I think, I'm never going to get out of here, Right? Not once did I think I'm never going to see my family again. I mean, my seven-year-old self may have thought that if that would have happened to me at seven years old. But my adult self knew that, there was, there was, that I was going to get out eventually. Like there was a way out of here. It's just going to take some, some time and some effort and some resources. 
uh, but, but it, would, it, would, it would come to an end, all right? I realized that as, uh, as an adult. Um, it, you know, we, we opened this series uh, a few weeks ago by talking about the discipleship uh, square. And, and here's, here's the kind of the disciple's journey from D1, D2, D3, D4. Like D1 is when you first become a follower of Jesus. So, so just, just kind of channel back to that time when you first started following Jesus. I mean, life was, it was new. Uh, it was exciting. You, you began to, to have some new desires, some new goals, some new aspirations. You saw things in a little different uh, kind of light. Uh, and and you, you were loving that stage of life, but a few years in, or even maybe a few months in, you're into D2, and you realize that following Jesus is not nearly as easy as you thought it would be. Like old patterns, old habits started creeping back uh, in. You, you, uh, you, you started to miss old friends that you hung out with. You started to miss old routines. You started to miss your old Saturday night routine. You started to miss your old Sunday morning routine, right? When you were sleeping in. And so you thought, you know what? I'm just going to take a few weeks off of, off of church. Like this is where most believers get stuck right here. They, get, they just get stuck and they don't know how to move forward. They don't give up on faith. They just give up on growth. And they just settle. Settle for comfy, cushy, Christianity, where, where nothing really changes, but the sweet spot of discipleship, like, is when you turn the corner to D3. If you can make that turn, when you get into D3, uh, when, when things, uh, you start to grow, you start to experience some spiritual wisdom. So when you, when you experience problems, like, you have a filter for it. You, you gain some spiritual strength where you can endure those things. Everything uh, there, it, it starts to make a little bit more sense to you, and then you get to D four. Like D four is like the cruise control of Christianity. Okay, so so here here's how here's how disciples respond to problems. In D one, uh, there are no problems. D two, a problem is like, wait a minute, I thought there weren't supposed to be any problems. Where did this problem come from? I thought following Jesus was going to be easy, right? And then in D three, it's like, all right. I understand that, that it's not going to be all that easy, and I've got an, a, an issue right now, and so I, you know what I'm going to do? I, I would just fuss about it, but now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray about it. And like, D, you get to D4, and it's like, fix it, Jesus, and you just keep on going, right? Because you're in, you're in cruise control Christianity. Um, and that's, that's kind of the cycle, right? When you're in D4, like, you just pray about everything. When Paul says, pray without ceasing, you know, for most of us, like, what are you even talking about, Paul? But in D4, you're like, you know exactly what Paul's talking about, because you just live in this zone all the time. Like, this is the journey of a disciple. But for most believers, we just get stuck in the bathroom of D2, and we just stay there. All right, but we're pressing here for, for breakthrough, and Paul is pushing for breakthrough in this letter. Paul is writing to young believers because everybody at this time is a relatively young believer because Christianity is a relatively new thing. And so what he's addressing in this letter is the basic dilemma of every believer, and it's this. What does life in Christ look like, and how do I get there? This is the question. What does following Jesus really look like? And how do I get there? How do I attain that? What needs to change in my life to look like that? That's what Paul is really unpacking in this letter. The first three chapters, we're going we're gonna to land in on the end of chapter 3 today, but the first three chapters of Ephesians is really all about what we believe. Paul really hasn't given, given any moral commandments to, to this point. He's just talking about doctrine. He talks about the Trinity uh, and, and, the, and the work of the Trinity in salvation, the Father's role, the Son's role, the Spirit's role. He talks about Jesus' position and authority, that the Father has put all things under His authority. And then we, that's chapter 1, then we go into chapter 2. He talks about how we have been resurrected, that we were dead in our sins, but, but we've been raised up to new life uh, in Christ. And he says that we're seated with Christ right? Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, and Paul says, we're seated with him in the heavenly realms, which means we share the authority of Jesus. And we talked about that a few weeks ago and what that looks like. We have resurrection power. We are saved by grace through faith for good works. We are God's workmanship, God's handiwork, as Paul says 
in, uh, in verse 10 of chapter 2. We have peace with other people because Jesus has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. He has made us one people. So that means that everyone who believes in Jesus is a son and daughter of the king, which means we are brothers and sisters to one another. So no matter where you're from, no matter what language you speak, no matter what color your skin is, we are all part of one family. And so Paul has spent this entire time telling us who we are and what we believe. And beginning in chapter 4, which we'll dive into next week, he'll start telling us how we should live in light of what we believe. What we should do in light of who we are. But before he gets there, he pauses to pray. And this is a pivotal moment in the letter because here's what Paul knows. That what he's about to say next in the next three chapters is absolutely impossible for us to do. Outside of the Spirit of God and His power at work in us. And so this prayer that we're going to look at is the Louisville Slugger that brings the breakthrough that will move us from having right beliefs to having right behavior, from being to doing, from, from, uh, you know, position to actual practice, from D2 to D3. So let's, let's dive into it. Starting in verse 14, he says this, for this reason. Now, if you have your Bibles, look there, uh, and you might remember this from last week. Chapter 1, or chapter 3, verse 1, starts the same way. Paul says, for this reason. And then in verse 14, he says, for this reason again. And I love this. I love this because Paul starts chapter 3 uh, intending to pray, and then he gets sidetracked. He starts talking about something else. Now, how many of you have ever lost focus when you're praying? How many of you have been praying, you know, in your mind, and you're like, in a, 30 seconds later, you got a different conversation going on with somebody else? <laughs> this happens to Paul. I love it. Right? So Paul, he, you know, he gets off track, gets sidetracked. He, he goes on for 12 verses. But in verse 14, he gets refocused. Right? And and he changes his posture. He says, For this reason, I kneel before the Father. Listen, if you ever wander in prayer, change your posture. Like when you're on your knees, you usually stay on track. When you're on your knees, it's hard to think about lunch. Like the discomfort is a constant reminder of why you knelt in the first place. Now, I don't know if that's why Paul knelt. Uh, here, the most common way that, that folks would pray then was they would stand. And I think Paul was like, I, you know, I got to switch up the posture here because of the importance of what I'm praying for. Like the phrase for this reason uh, is the equivalent of the, the word therefore in scripture. And you remember what there, you know, when, when, we, when we see a therefore, we go back and see what it's there for. Right? So that's for this reason. And he's taken us all the way back to the end of chapter 2. For this reason. And what he talks about at the end of the chapter 2 is the church, the unity of the church. And so he's praying for the church. He's praying for the unity of, church, of the church. He's praying for the church to be a light in a dark world. And Paul is kneeling probably on a stone floor. He's chained to a Roman guard. And he's not praying for himself. He's not praying for his circumstances. He's not lamenting to God about how unfair this is. I have been so faithful to you. Why did you allow me to end up in this place? He's not praying for justice to be served so that he can be released. He's not praying that God would bring another earthquake like he did when he was in prison in Philippi that led to his release. In fact, Paul, if you read Paul's prayers throughout the New Testament, he rarely prays for himself. Like he says, you know, I, wait, one time I had this thorn in the f- flesh and I prayed three times and God answered me. And I didn't need to pray about that anymore. Paul prays for the church. Paul prays for believers. Paul prays for the gospel to go global. He doesn't pray for the comfort of Christians. He prays for strength to get uncomfortable. And so let's just take a quick inventory here. When you pray, 
What do you pray for? When you pray, what do you pray for? Do you pray for God to give you stuff that you want? Raise a new position, a new title, a new car? Do you pray for God to take away the stuff you don't want? Like a coworker that annoys you? Like Jesus, move her. <laughs> Fair. You pray for a challenge you don't want to face? Guilty. Listen, it's not bad to pray for, for those things, but if we're being honest, and this is, this is kind of the, you know, I'm just stepping on toes a little bit. Most of us would have to admit that most of our prayers center around ourselves most of the time. They just do. And if that's how most of us pray most of the time, is it any wonder that the church is almost ineffectual in dealing with the junk in our culture? Is it any wonder that the church has virtually lost its influence in the culture? Is it any wonder why people don't actually want to go to church when they see very little difference in the people who do? Now, I'm not saying don't pray for your needs. What I am saying is don't just pray for your needs. Pray for the church. Pray for your church. Pray for Centerpoint Church. Pray for our mission to make disciples. Pray for our vision of doubling our kingdom impact. Pray that our new space will be a, a place of healing and a place of renewal and a place of transformation as people encounter and experience the unconditional love of Jesus. Paul, pray that we would make a difference in this community. Pray that we would be a light in this community. Pray that lives would be changed in this community because this church exists. Pray for our leaders. I'm telling you, our staff and our elders are all doing double duty because we are understaffed. Pray that, pray that we would get some help. Better, better yet, be the help we've been praying for. Come alongside. Being part of a church means that you are part of something bigger than yourself, so you have to start praying for something bigger than yourself. And, and so Paul, in this letter right here in verse 16, he goes into praying a giant prayer. And here's how, here's how this prayer starts. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, so right off the bat, let me just let you know, Jesus is unlimited. He's got glorious riches. He's got a deep well. Out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Wait a minute, Paul. I thought Jesus already dwelled in our hearts. And Paul would say, yeah, yeah, he, he does. I'm not praying for Christ to come in. I'm praying for Christ to take over. That's what I'm talking about here. The word dwell in the Greek means to feel at home. To feel at home. When, when somebody comes to your house and you tell them to make yourself at home, or better yet, if you go to somebody's house and they tell you to make yourself, make, make yourself at home, how many of you take them up on it? Okay, because, because when I'm at home, you know, I lounge, like I sprawl out on the couch or I'm in the, in, you know, in the man chair. I pilfer through the, the pantry looking for something to eat. I'm combing through the refrigerator, you know, looking for something to drink. I got the remote control. I'm changing the channel. I don't really care who's watching what. I'm just changing. I'm making myself at home. It's my home. <laughs> Were you watching that? I'm sorry. If I came to your house and you told me to make myself at home and I did, you'd be like, what is wrong with him? <laughs> I can't, you don't mean it. You don't want me going through your cabinets. You don't mean make yourself at home. Listen, there's a difference between being a resident and being a guest. Guests don't go through the pantry. Residents have refrigerator rights. 
And if you're, if you're lucky enough to have a friend where you have refrigerator rights, like that is a special relationship. I, I have refrigerator rights with my best friend Kelly. Like we've been friends for 40 years, right? We grew up together. Uh, he lives in Mississippi. And so when I, I don't get to go there very often, but when I go there and I, I raid his fridge, he doesn't have to tell me what you do. Can I get you something? Make yourself at home? I just do. I just go to the refrigerator and get something to drink. Then I look through the cabinets looking for the chips. Okay? Because his casa is mi casa. I don't know if that's the right Spanish piece of that, but I'm no Espanol. Um, su casa, mi. His house is my house, right? So I just make myself at home. I sit in his recliner. I, I use his remote control, right? Listen, if, when you sit in another man's recliner, you better be tight. true story. But I, I am not always comfortable. I'm not always comfortable in his house because he has permission to ask me about mine. You know what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about my house. I'm talking about my inner being, my spiritual house. He has permission to ask me about my marriage. He has permission to ask me about my eyes if, if I've seen anything or if I've looked at anything offensive. He has permission to ask me about my relationship with Jesus, about my quiet time, about my prayer life. See, a refrigerator friend isn't just somebody who eats your food. They get in your grill. And everybody needs that kind of friend. Like they ask the hard questions. They have a window into your soul. And if you don't have a friend like that, you need a friend like that. But, but Jesus, Jesus wants to be a friend like that. And that's what Paul is praying for, that Jesus would come and make himself at home in your heart so that he can go through it and he can clean it out. So let me just ask you a question. When it comes to your home, your inner being, is Jesus a guest or is he a refrigerator friend? Jesus isn't interested in being a guest in your home. He wants to rearrange the furniture and clean out the refrigerator. That's what he wants to do. He'll go through your family room and he'll change how you do relationships. He'll go through your man cave and change how you think about entertainment. He'll go through your study and, and reprioritize how you think about work. If you give him refrigerator rights, it is a scary thing. But listen, he will make your life better. And then Paul goes on. He says, here's what else I'll pray for. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp, to understand, to comprehend how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. So he's, he's shifting analogies from house to horticulture. Like a tree, a tree can only grow and flourish if it has deep roots. And an established tree is a sign of health. Its roots run deep. It's connected to a water source that allows it to grow and allows it to, to flourish. When you are rooted and grounded and established, your priorities change completely. You don't see God's word as duty. You see it as delight, like it nourishes you, it strengthens you, it challenges you, it changes you so that when the storms of life blow against you, it doesn't knock you over. You stand firm because you are firmly planted in Christ. You have power, you have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is his love. And not by yourself, but Paul says together, together, together. With God's holy people, you, you, the giant redwoods, what redwoods of California, anybody ever seen those massive trees? They get their strength from each other. Like their roots are intertwined and they literally hold each other up. Up. And this is why community is so important. This is why connection to the body is so important. This is why online church can't be a substitute. And it's why I've, you know, harped on it the last few weeks. Like, we need to be together. 
We need to worship together. We need to learn together. We need to pray together. The glory of God isn't meant to be experienced alone. See, when I see, when I see God working in your life, I am more adequately able to grasp the width of his love. When I hear what the Spirit is doing in your marriage, I'm able to more adequately grasp the depths and the lengths and the heights of God's grace. When I I watch you lift your hands in worship and I know your story, I know the challenges you're facing right now, I'm, I'm able to more adequately grasp how good God's love is we need to see each other so that we can see Christ in each other. I need to see Christ in you because it encourages my walk. It's part of how we grow. That's why we didn't just build a larger worship center. We built a large lobby that allows you to connect with one another. Online worship isn't artificial. It's just incomplete. Online worship is 2D worship. Like literally and spiritually, you need the body. The body is meant to be together. And Paul is praying uh, for that because he's going to lay down some challenge in chapter 4 that we're going to get to about what the body can accomplish when it works together. And then Paul continues this prayer. He prays for a contradiction. He says, I pray for you to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. So you want me to know something that, that, that you know, goes beyond my ability to know. It, it's, only, it's only a contradiction for those who don't follow Jesus. Like this is the privilege we have as children of God. This is the privilege we have as disciples of Jesus. This is the privilege we have as those who follow Jesus. We can know and experience a love that can't be fully known by anybody else. And that's why we want to do everything we can as a church to help people find and follow Jesus because that kind of love is life-changing. George Whitfield was an 18th century preacher who captivated crowds with, it, with his messages, but the best thing about him was his walk with Jesus. Like, and he kept journals, and one of his journals he wrote about a time when he experienced God's love in an overwhelming way. Look what he writes. He says, The freeness and riches of God's everlasting love broke in with such light and power upon my soul that I was often awed into silence and could not speak. I said, Stop it, God. I've got to get my rest. I've got to go to bed. The love, it's too much love. I had to ask God to stay his hand. You ever experienced God's love that way? I haven't read many books of late where people write like that. I mean, if you read the biographies, if you read the biographies of some of the the great spiritual giants of history, like this seems to be a common theme. They write about these overwhelming experiences with God, people like John Wesley and, and Charles Spurgeon and Jonathan Edwards and William Booth and Florence Nightingale and Amy Carmichael, these these spiritual giants. And the reason for these experiences, I think, is simple. They were filled to the measure of the fullness of God. There was no competition. There was no competition. Our experience with God is only as wide as our relationship with God is deep. If your relationship is shallow, your experience will be narrow. If this is the depth of your relationship, this is the width of your experience. Do you want this experience or do you want this experience? Because this experience requires this depth right here. So let me just ask you, what are you full of? What are you full of? I think the reason that that so many of us don't experience God like that is because we are just full of other things. We're so busy. 
We're full of work, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. We don't have time to be full of God. We're full of kids' activities, like we got multiple kids and multiple sports and events all year long. Listen, if your kids run your calendar, your kids will be your God. And one day they're going to grow up and leave. And what will you worship then? Worship God and teach your kids how to do the same. Don't worship your kids. We're full of entertainment. Like, when's the last time you went a full day without having the TV on? When's the last time you went an hour without scrolling through social media? When's the last time you got off of Facebook and went, God, stay your hand, I'm so full. (laughs) Can't take it, stop it. Man, I get off depressed. I don't know about you. I'm like, why do I subject myself to this stuff? And we wonder, we just wonder why, why, we're so, why, why we feel such a disconnect in our soul. It's because we're full of, of something other than God. And if you're full of anything other than God, I'm just telling you, you're empty. You're empty. That's how God wired us. Like joy is found in the fullness of God. Happiness is found in the fullness of God. Contentment is found in the fullness of God. Pleasure is found in the fullness of God. Purpose is found in the fullness of God. And when we are filled with the measure of the fullness of God, that's when relationships flourish. It's when your job becomes a mission It's when you you begin to understand and comprehend and grasp God's love and you understand his invitation into something bigger. It's when life starts to make sense. That's what Paul prays for. And that's a breakthrough prayer that will move you. That will move you into a new plane of the spiritual life. Like prayer is the thin nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence in your life. Prayer is that thing that moves the hand of God and changes everything. I want to go back to this, uh, this picture. There's, there's still a problem here. I don't know if you know what it is. I, I can't get through that. Now, I know some people who can. Scott Sieber can walk through that. I, I, well, he's preaching now. I mean, I'm bigger than the hole, right? So I, there's only one way I'm getting through here. It's on my knees. Like I had to get low. I had to kneel down to experience the breakthrough. And so here's what, here's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to ask you to do something that's, that's going to be uncomfortable, like in, in multiple ways. I'm going to ask you to kneel. Some of you, you can't kneel, I understand that. And if you can't kneel, I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'm going to walk you through this prayer, and I want you to spend some time praying. So right now, and if you're at home too, especially if you're in bed. (laughs) Like no laying prostrate. Okay? Get up off the couch. So if you can kneel, I want you to kneel. If, if you can't kneel, I want you to stand. And I want, I want your palms up like this, regard, whatever position you're in. I want your palms up, and I want your eyes closed. And I just want to lead you through this prayer. I'm going to give you some prayer prompts. Because I don't, I, don't, I don't want to ask you to go home and do this. I, ho- I hope you will. But, but let, I just want to practice it right now. So, so palms up. Eyes closed. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So here's what I want you to pray for right now. I want you to pray that, that Jesus would make himself at home in your hearts and change whatever needs to be changed 
that's keeping you stuck, just spend a minute or so praying that prayer. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So I want you to pray right now that God would give you deep spiritual roots that he would empty you of everything that's filling you right now so that only he is left. Now I want you to ask him to fill you up to the measure of all the fullness of God. And when you've done that, when you've prayed that, that God would fill you up, I want you to take communion right where you are. Whenever you're done with that prayer, I want you to take communion right where you are, kneeling or standing, to remind you that, you, that, that through the cross, you already know this love that surpasses knowledge. So here's how Paul closes this incredible prayer. Everybody right now, palms up. Eyes closed, palms up, eyes closed. Now to him who was able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever.